Okay, let's start. Welcome everyone. Hope you had a good good lunch. Um, what I'm going to talk about to, um, uh, today is um, our async code reviews and um, the study that I did um, that has spanned a um, um, period of six plus months. At the, and it involved uh, typical product um, development teams. Uh, I analyzed around 40 plus very active repositories and tens of thousands of pull requests. So today I'm going to sh um, share with you the conclusions that I got out of the study. So my name is Dragan Stepanovic. I work as a senior principal engineer at a company called um, Talbot, which is a delivery hero company. And um, my main Areas of interest are XP, extreme programming, TOC, um, which is theory of constraints, lean, systems thinking. And um, I tend to rant on um, social media and on a blog. And there's also one terrifying fact about me is that I put mayo on pizza for some reason. I don't know if there are any Italians in the audience, but yeah, it would be really funny to see their faces now. Um, so just to to frame the, the talk for today. Um, I'm not saying that the context that I had is the same context that you had. Um, I won't be telling you that you should do the things that I concluded for, for the teams that I've been working with. Um, I'll just share the uh, learnings that I had out of this journey. So not sure how many of you have heard for this quote. Nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. And the quote comes from 80s, as far as I remember. Um, and the idea was that most of the uh, folks from the procurement departments um, went with IBM as a default, as a vendor, because IBM at, at the time had a huge market share. And it was easier to go with them because everyone else went with IBM. And um, if anything goes wrong, it's IBM. Hey would have thought. Um, and the other thing is that the folks that wanted to go with some other vendor had to answer a lot of questions and that made, made the whole process expensive for them to procure someone else. So it really depends on the context uh, in which you're operating in and what are the problems you're trying to solve. So when I say nobody ever got fired for buy, uh, buying IBM, <clears throat> um, and when I think about the typical software development process that we tend to have in the teams, I often think about the PR-based async code review. So I try to visualize it here. And we have, let's say, two developers, Emma and Luca. And it's a start of the sprint. Let's say that the team is working in a sprint, uh, in a Scrum um, methodology. And um, Emma pulls in ticket number one. Here, and Luca pulls in ticket number two. So they start working on, on their own respective tickets. And at one point, Emma codes, makes some changes, introduces some changes to the system, hopefully tests. And at one point, she figures out, OK, I think I should ask for a review from my peers. So she creates a pull request um, and invites Luca for a review. But Luca is busy with something else. So he's working on ticket number two. There are lots of other things going around. Um, lunch, um, breaks, um, outside of the business hours, uh, review meetings, checking Slack, checking email, etc., reviewing other PRs. So Luke is not able to immediately respond. And what happens is uh, also Emma, while well, she's figuring out, OK, since I'm waiting, I want to be a good employee, so I want to keep working on something. So she pulls in another ticket, ticket number three. At one point, she figures out, about, OK, Luca is not answering. Maybe I should uh, remind him. And I often see these please and you know these begging emojis in these kind of systems where the work in progress is really high. I would even say that the amount of uh, brain hands that you see in the systems is proportional to the amount of whip that you get to see. So the system is telling you something. Uh, but at one point, uh, Luca is able to come around and he reviews the change, asks for some um, 
they produce the PR, ask for some changes, um, and sends back the PR to Emma. <clears throat> but Emma is busy with something else now. So she's working on ticket number three. There are lots of other things going on, so she's not able to react immediately now. And eventually she comes uh, around and she incorporates the changes <clears throat> and they go back and forth. And at one point, they converge, approve the pull request, and merge it. Um, so interesting thing to look at here is there are lots of things going around, but if you focus on ticket number one um, and we look at its lead time from start to finish, there are two different types of things that are going on with it. So one thing is uh, ticket number one is being actively worked on, which is called in lean processing or touch time. And the other way, uh, other thing that is going on is the wait time. So when the <clears throat> item is just sitting there in a queue waiting for someone's attention. So to provide a bit more of a context of the study that I did, um, I tend to advise uh, and uh, mentor and coach teams um, in a way that we try together to figure out how to maximize the throughput of the value of the whole team. And one of the things that they tend to use uh, to look at is the way that people work in a team, right? Mm. So my guiding principle is meet people where they are. And often in the teams that do uh, PR-based async code reviews, there's a certain uh, percentage of um, managers and engineers that would like to have a bit more data-informed way when it comes to different way of working. Yes, we would like to try out something else, but how does it compare to what we have currently now? So we would like also to, visual our, um, um, to visualize our current system. So what was I curious to see? <clears throat> Me coming from the extreme programming background, which is um, very heavy on collaboration, as you might know, peer and more programming, um, whole team approach. I had a hunch for a couple of things that I was really curious to see. Um, one thing was engagement and the effects of the delays that we get to see in the system and because of this high work in progress. The other thing was wait time, um, going back to this visual that I just presented, and trying to figure out how much of a wait time we get to see in these kind of systems. And also, how does that compare to the size of the pull requests or the amount of effort that we put in, in um, <clears throat> creating um, work items. So going into engagement, uh, why was I curious about the engagement? So <clears throat> I had this analogy in my head. Um, if I have a phone call with someone and there's a delay in communication between us, what tends to happen is that the conversation dies off very soon. So because of a delay, the engagement has to go down, and because of that, the communication ties off, meaning we uh, faster converge. And uh, the other thing, while I was, what I was curious about when it comes to the engagement was uh, the choked feedback. And when I say choked feedback, <clears throat> I refer to uh, the usual solutions that we use for reviewing pull requests, providing feedback and comments, which is you know, GitHub, GitLab, etc. And the way that most of the teams provide feedback is in a written form. And written word is way more expensive than a, um, a verbal communication. It takes a longer time to write. Um, and it's also because it's delayed, there are other problems with it. <clears throat> and I notice there's um, way, way more feedback provided when it's a verbal timely feedback uh, when it comes to the um, collaboration in the so that's what they call the high latency, low throughput feedback in, um, in this kind of mode, in this way of working. And uh, so going into the first scatter plot, but this is just a sample. I think this was 500 pull requests. Um, each dot that you see here is a single pull request. So on the x-axis, you can see size in lines of code. Now, when it comes to the complexity of the work, um, you can measure it in a dozen ways. One way to, is to just go ahead with um, um, lines of code. The other one is to, I don't know, count number of affected files, of number of packages, etc. But for the study that they did, I noticed that 
simple lines of code was enough. And on the y-axis, you can see the engagement. Now, the engagement, the way that I calculated it was that I was uh, looking at the amount of feedback in terms of the amount of comments that I get to see. And, um, but I also had in mind that um, lots of the comments um, were trivial. And definition of trivial for me was kind of, um, I use the definition that it's kind of silly, but it's like less than four words. And the idea behind that was that I get to see often, especially in the big PRs, this LGTM plus one looks good to me, et cetera, right? So these are the comments that don't really provide actionable feedback for people to uh, act on it. So on the y-axis, you can see the number of non-trivial comments. Now it's a question of what do we see from here? Probably nothing, right? There's just a cluster of data um, from this representable data set. I would say most of the PRs are less than 500 lines of code and have less than 12 uh, non-trivial comments, right? But then I started thinking about it. And if I invest, let's say, a lot of time, let's say seven days working on something and I get a certain amount of feedback, it's not the same as if I invest 10 minutes and I get the same amount of feedback, right? So I was thinking, what happens if we actually normalize the y-axis, the engagement, to be the engagement per size, right? And plot it against the size. So the engagement per size is the number of non trivial comments per 100 lines of code thing that we can see here. And this was interesting, but it was also expected in a sense. So it was interesting because what we can see from here is that as you increase the size of the pull request, the um, amount of feedback that you get tends to go exponentially lower. Uh, down amount of feedback per size, right? So this was um, for me meant something. So I was trying to interpret this, and this was the insight that I got from all of the data set that I've, I've been analyzing. And thing is, if we use code reviews as a process, at least as a process to provide feedback in order to build the quality in, if we are not able to get the feedback, then we are also not able to build the quality in. So what I'm saying is that most probably this means that as we increase the size of the of the PRs, the, um, there's there's a higher chances that we have lack of engagement, right? And that means that um, we are less likely to build the quality, in, right? So I'm not saying anything about the left hand side. I'm not saying that if you have feedback that you have quality, because it really depends on the type of the feedback, seniority of people providing the feedback, etc. Right. So I'm just saying that if you're using this method in order to build the quality and, and we're not able to get the feedback in the first place, then we're not able to get the quality as well, to build the quality. And this was kind of uh, expected, systemic insight that was expected for me. Um, I love this quote, never had a huge PR that didn't look good to me. Um, and perhaps some of you also saw this, um, this tweet. So, um, that was expected in a sense, right? I think all of us already have this by, by laugh, so I can understand that we share the experience. Um, and when it comes to building PR, building quality in with big, big PRs, I just recently bumped into this tweet, and this is how I see it. So reviewers feel like these viewers, you know, spreading their arms, trying to prevent people from going onto the pitch, but not really happening. Um, so that was engagement. That was the thing that I kind of expected, right? But then when it comes to the wait time, I had some surprising insights that I also didn't expect. So if we go back to this visual here um, and focus on ticket number one and also look at this um, uh, timeline at the bottom, we just focus on ticket number one and see its lead time. Um, we can notice that there are parts of its lead time where we are actively working on this item and parts of its lead time when this item is just sitting there in a queue waiting for someone's attention. Right? So I was curious to see how does this look like in, um, in terms of the, of the numbers. And the way that I went about um, defining the wait time, it's approximation. So every approximation is good in some cases, in some cases it's not. So there are some assumptions related to it. Um, 
And if you're interested, you're going to find um, a series of articles where I dig uh, deeper inside of, of this metric and trying to understand the, or at least down the assumptions and the preconditions for the assumptions being uh, good enough. But the way that I went about it was a typical developer takes in a ticket and they start working on an item. At one point, they figure out they are done. They invite other people for, um, for feedback. And at that point, the wait time starts um, to, um, to tick. So in a sense of, from the last commit that we get to see, or from raising a pull request until the pull request has been merged, um, that's the wait time approximation here. If I find a data set that tends to indicate that there has been significant or um, substantial amount of back and forths in the sense of comments being exchanged between the reviewers and author, what I see uh, commits after raising a pull request that indicates that the approximation is not good enough. And that's one thing to also have in mind. So going into just one of the examples. Um, so here we see um, just results for, um, this was a data set of 500 merged pull requests. And uh, this uh, team, they, they took them uh, six months to produce this uh, 500 pull requests, it mean, meaning that it took them 500. Uh, it took them uh, six months to push this 500 pull request through the system of work. Okay, and what was interesting to see is that the wait time cumulative in 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 months was almost 28 months. Now these numbers are not accurate, um, but if they even if they're accurate 30 percent, they're accurate more than that. Um, they are really good uh, conversation starter. So people start talking about it in a sense of. What are the things that we can improve um, based on this, right? So this is also important because if we think about digital products and generally software, right, we use it in order to deliver value to our customers. Now, if the work is stuck in our system for a longer time, that also means for the cases when we deliver value to our customers, we delay delivery of the value to our customers, right? For these things that have been stuck for this time. I'm not saying that all work is equally valuable. There are some things that are less valuable than the others, but they're all always kind of stakeholders and everyone, um, every change usually has some impact, uh, be it developers or some other people inside of the company or um, hopefully customers, right? So this is um, the going into the scatter plot for the wait time. Um, on x-axis, we can see, again, size in lines of code and why we can see wait time in hours. So what we can see here is not much again. Uh, most of the PRs take less than 200 uh, hours to, of a wait time, right? But then I was thinking, again, if I work, let's say, seven days and I wait for... Um, and raise a pull request, and then I wait for feedback for two days, it's not the same as when I work 10 minutes and then wait for a feedback for two days. Right? So what happens if we plot the wait time uh, now to be wait time per size? So the things become quite um, different. And this was also the systemic behavior that was visible across um, all the data sets where the teams have been doing this in code reviews. Now, I was thinking how to interpret this, and the way that I understand it is that as we reduce the size of the pull request, the wait time per size goes exponentially up, meaning that the cost of code review per size goes exponentially up, right? Um, this is really interesting because what we're saying is that the smaller the change, the more, expensive, uh, the more expensive it is to push through the system, right? And I have been advising the teams that have been doing um, big pull requests, you know, just reduce the size of the pull request, make it smaller. But then I found out through this um, study that actually small PRs also have um, trade-offs when it comes to the async code reviews, right? And why do we want to have small PRs? Because the idea of small batches from Lean, 
Um, smaller PRs are quicker to write. They are also um, uh, quicker to review. Uh, people need less time allocation to review the pull request. Also, coming back and forth is um, usually quicker. They're less risky because less change um, introduced. When we talk about the accelerate and for key metrics, they um, shorten the lead time to change and increase the deployment frequency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So that's the way that I see the the the, the behavior that this kind of system incentivizes with this kind of economics, right? Um, and thinking about it, I'm sure that um, lots of you have uh, came across the cases when, let's say, a team has a test suite that takes to that takes a long time to run. Let's say uh, there's a, it takes them 20 minutes to run the test suite, right? Uh, if that's the case, then I'm not going to be running the test suite after every line of code change, right? Because it doesn't make economic sense. Why? Because most of the time I'll be spending just sitting there waiting for the test suite to finish, right? So what the system and economics here in this system is incentivizing me is to increase the size of the of the batch, right? To introduce introduce more changes to the system before running the tests right? in order to get the biggest bang for a buck. Um, so the way that I see it is that inventory in the system, so the amount of changes that you introduce for in this example, expands until uh, it matches the delays that you get in the system. And why is this important? Because um, I don't know how many of you remember this um, game that at least some of us have played when we were kids with siblings or cousins, but um, someone hides the item and then you know the other person provides them feedback, but they provide them feedback, um, you know, is it hot, hot um, um, warm or cold? And based on that feedback, they're able to find the item, right? Now, if you have two teams, where one team provides feedback after a minute and the other team provides feedback after a second, I guess that most of you are going to bet on the team that, that um, gets the feedback after one second that they're going to find the item sooner, right? So there's the same idea about why optimizing the process in this case will lead you to, um, um, to find a, custom, a value for a customer sooner, right? So because the learning cadence is faster. And um, I love this quote from Don uh, Reinertsen. So while you may ignore economics, it won't ignore you because of the incentives of the system that have been set up um, because of that. And uh, I was thinking about how to, you know, how to map out this model um, that they have in head in, in the sense of why is this the case? You know, why do teams that do async code reviews also when they try to reduce the size of the PRs usually end up going back. And this is a causal loop diagram, um, if anyone is familiar. So with it, it comes from the systems thinking. And I'm just going to give you a short crash course on it. Um, it's, it's quite simple. So there are variables that we see here as labels. And variables can be uh, connected in two different ways. So they can be there can be either minus sign between them and there can be a plus sign. And this link is a causal link. So if I have one variable and the other variable that are connected, if, if this one moves, this one also moves. If the sign is plus, if this one moves up, this other one also moves up and the other way around. If the uh, relation is minus, meaning the opposite, when one variable goes up, the other one goes down and vice versa, okay? So interesting thing also happens when mapping causal loop diagrams is that you might notice after connecting all the things that some um, that some uh, feedback loops uh, pop up, right? And there are also two important feedback loops um, that are worth considering, or actually part of, of the causal loop diagrams, rather. Uh, one is the reinforcing feedback loop, and the other one is a balancing feedback loop. Now, a reinforcing feedback loop, as you might guess, is uh, this kind of snowball effect, right? And the balancing feedback loop is the feedback loop that kind of seeks the target, in a sense. So at home, you know, you, when you set up the, let's say, thermostat to 21 degrees, you know, the system is pushing the um, kind of, it's working until it, it, it um, achieves the target, right? So and it, if you open the door and outside is cold, it works even more in order to be able to achieve this target. 
So this is a balancing fit before. So let's just go uh, quickly through, I'll just walk you through the, the diagram. So here, if we have a PR size of certain size, PR, sorry, of certain size, and we uh, try to halve it, let's say, if uh, we reduce the size of the pull request, then the motivation or incentive to review goes up because people want to review smaller PRs usually, right? Um, that means that also time waiting for a review from author's perspective goes down, which means that their perceived cost of code review per line of code also goes down, which on the other side is incentivizing them to keep reducing the size of the pull request. And that's a reinforcing feedback that we get to see here, which is a great thing to have. Now, there are other things also uh, going on, and that is that if you work in the async code reviews manner, and we reduce the size of the pull requests, then the number of PRs to review in a given unit of time goes up. Right? So if it took me one week to develop a PR, and let's say everyone on the team um, takes the same amount of time to develop that, um, then we, when we halve the PRs, then we're going to have twice as many uh, pull requests to review in uh, a week, right? So the thing with uh, a higher number of uh, pull requests to review is that they also mean um, higher number of interruptions for the reviewers and also for authors in a given unit of time, right? And if you keep reducing the size of the pull request, you're going to hit a point where the number of interruptions is unbearable for people and everyone wants to protect also their personal flow. And that also means that the motivation or incentive to review uh, given pull requests goes down, which on the other hand increases the time waiting for a review from an author's perspective and the perceived cost of code review goes up, which incentivizes the PR size to go up. So that's a balancing feedback loop that is balancing out this reinforcing behavior. And there is a shift in dominance usually between these two loops. As you keep um, reducing the size of the pull request, balancing feedback loop tends to gain more um, dominance. Um, but there are also th other things going on here that we saw with um, Emma. It's that... Uh, is that if we increase the time waiting for a review while Emma is waiting for a review from Luca, she starts working on something else, right? And that increases the ups, that decreases the number of peers to, to review, right? So it kind of reinforces this balancing feedback loop that we see here. There is a problem here because we have a conflict here. So from one side, um, the system is increasing the motivation or incentive to review, and from the other side, it's decreasing. So that leads me to a flow efficiency, one of the metric from the metrics from the lean. And um, flow efficiency is kind of a simple metric. We look at the lead time of a given item, and we figure out when the, um, we have been working on the item, which is a work um, here, or processing, or touch time. Uh, and we also look at how much um, the item is waiting, sitting there in, in a queue, and we calculate out of the whole lead time, how much of processing time was there, right? So the higher the flow efficiency, the better the process you have, and the opposite. So I started analyzing flow efficiency for these data sets, and what I got to find is this um, kind of a behavior. Um, so on the y-axis, you, you can see the, the flow efficiency. And here, in this data set, the flow efficiency starts plummeting around 120 lines of code, it doesn't really matter. But the important thing or important point to have uh, to think about here is that in this kind of system, with this kind of economic, let's say that we want to introduce a 300 lines of code change, right? So, and let's say that we can do it at least in two ways. So one way is um, splitting the work into 15 PRs of 20 lines of code. And the other one is just having one PR of 300 lines of code. Now, in this kind of system, the cumulative lead time for these 15 PRs of 20 lines of code is going to be way longer than the cumulative lead time that is going to take us to push these 300 lines of code through our system. Right? Now, I'm not saying anything about the amount of value that we're introducing with this, but if the system is choked in a sense that you are not even able to push the things soon out of the door, then you are not able to get the value as well in the cases when you get value from the changes that you introduce, right? 
So, um, what this means for me is that actually on the lower um, side of the spectrum of the size of the PR, we lose throughput, right? So the smaller the PR, the more they get to weight uh, inside of a system per size. And um, we have the, the behavior that means that we need to trade off between two things, right? One is the uh, quality that we talked about, and the other one is throughput. And when you think about it, actually, um, when the, the interesting thing here is when, when, we, when we think about the whole process is that as we reduce the size of the pull request, uh, the processing time tends to go down linearly uh, or, or um, stays constant, processing time precise. Why? Because we are mostly dependent on ourselves when we code, right? But the thing with the wait time here and uh, the review process is that um, the, as we reduce the size of the pull request, the wait time per size goes exponentially up as we saw it. And why? Because if you have smaller PRs, that means that dependency starts kicking in with other people sooner, right? And more often. So it becomes more expensive, which this, then this ratio weight to uh, to processing time goes exponentially up because the wait time is going exponentially up, which affects the flow efficiency, causes it to plummet, and it also means that the throughput is going down. So, from one side, we have uh, inability to build the quality in with big PRs. On the other side, we have a problems with the throughput, and uh, the smaller the PR, the less. Uh, throughput we get from our system. And that's this eternal uh, battle between speed versus quality, throughput versus quality, throughput versus stability, whatever you call it. Um, for anyone that has had a chance to read um, Don Reinerson's book, it was mentioned today, I think, at least once, uh, The Principles of Product Development Flow, and I really recommend it to managers, but also to engineers. This problem is actually about this um, um, optimal batch size uh, opt, um, curve, U, which is called U-curve, optim, op, uh, optimal batch size U-curve, yeah. Uh, and here we were talking actually about the transaction cost. Now, it's a pretty washed out slide, but the, the, the optimal batch size is here. Right? So you can see it from, from this point of here is uh, the batch size, because it's trying to optimize between the holding costs that we see here and the transaction cost that we just talked about. Um, and this led me to um, think about the work that has been done as part of the um, Accelerate book, which is a summary of a uh, daughter research state of DevOps, where you know this, for me, the biggest conclusion was that instead of thinking either throughput or stability, uh, there is actually you know um, both throughput and stability. When one goes up, the other one also goes up and vice versa. So um, we tend to hear all, uh, lots of the times in our industry that there's always trade-offs, and I agree with that, but there are some cases where the trade-offs don't actually exist because the underlying assumption is flawed. So it's really important how do we frame the problem in the first place. And um, I think we can have our cake and eat it too at the same time. So if we try to work backwards, from the problem that we have. So we're saying that if the cost of code review per size is going exponentially up, then the throughput is plummeting. Um, what do we need to do in order for the throughput to be constant? Right? So if we need to um, keep the throughput constant as we decrease the size of the pull request, and again, we want to have smaller pull requests, that means that the cost of code review per line of code or per size uh, must not go up exponentially, actually, it needs to stay constant, right? In order to do this, um, the actor's reaction time, when I say actors, I mean authors and reviewers, in the whole process, needs to go down as we decrease the size of the pull request. Remember, Emma and Luca, they weren't able to react immediately, and that's what is driving up the cost of the code review per size, right? So as we decrease the size of the pull request, they need to react exponentially faster and faster and faster in order to not lose the throughput at the end. And in order to do that, we need to increase their availability, meaning 
Here in theory, Little's law for anyone that is familiar with it, um, less work in progress in the system in order to keep um, people less busy, which means that they're able to react sooner. So if we go back to this ticket number one, and I we just pull out, can we you see anything? Oh, yes. Um, just focus on ticket number one, and this is a timeline of the events. And we, let's say that we have this uh, size of the pull request, and let's say that we want to decrease the size of the pull request. In order for us to not lose the throughput, as we decrease the size of the pull request, M and Luca need to react faster, right? If you keep reducing at one point, they will have to react immediately in order not to lose the throughput. And that was the kind of conclusion of my study. In order to not exponentially lose the throughput um, while reducing the size of the pull request, people need to get exponentially closer and closer and closer in time which at one point leads us to continuous code review, right? And if we go back to this causal loop diagram here, there was a problem, um, this conflict that we had in this point, right? Which was caused by the number of interruptions that we get to see in the system. But you cannot get interrupted if you're not doing anything else. So if you're working on the same item as the other person, or you're not doing anything else, that's not really an interruption for you, right? So that is a segue to this parallel universe that they call co-creation patterns. I hope that all of you at least have heard for pair and more programming. But interesting thing here um, with working together when it comes to this whole process is that um, because the we have someone sitting next to us giving us review immediately. The cost of code review per line of code is actually minimal because they are providing us the, the wait time is zero effectively, right? Which means that now we are still not able to see this. There is this optimal um, optimal batch size which was here, and then because we reduce the transaction cost, we are able to shift the, the optimal size of the batch to the left, all the way to the left. Um, and I was thinking, okay, how would this look like in case we did a uh, pair of more programming, in case we co-created, right? So when we think about the wait time per size, if I'm able to get the feedback immediately, right, that means that the wait time per size is actually zero. And effective size of the pull request, if your pull request is dependent only on the code review, is one line of code, or the atomic change that the person, that the driver is doing, is making, right? Now, when it comes to the engagement, um, the engagement tends to stay um, the same or at least goes up. Why? Because the, um, the, the feedback is more timely and the communication is also verbal, so the broadband of the medium is, is higher. Uh, plus, we're also able to faster course correct each other. Right? And I was thinking then, you know, okay, if that's the case and we get actually the continuous code review as a byproduct of co-creation and thinking about all of these metrics here, um, I was thinking, okay, you know, can we find um, a number that we can use to kind of describe um, the things that we're trying to optimize for? So we want the size to go down, right? The pull request size. We want the wait time per size also to go down. And we also want to engagement per size uh, if not to go up, then at least not to go down to stay constant. That's where it used the size of the pull request, right? So you might have noticed this bar here on the side, which is a thing that they call PR score. And if we try to map into a formula these things that we're trying to optimize for and their relationship, so you know there's a size, uh, there's a wait time in seconds, and the engagement, and for co-creation. When we get the feedback immediately, the effective um, size of the pull request can be to the point that it's one line of code. Uh, wait time is zero, and engagement is whatever constant or it goes up. I divide by one plus engagement because engagement can be sometimes zero non-trivial comments, and I don't want to divide by zero. Actually, no one wants to divide by zero. And this whole thing evaluates to zero, 
Um, now the thing was, I was trying to calculate this also for the async code reviews, and the numbers were so high that they had to use the natural logarithm here. So to to evaluate it uh, uh, at the end, and the 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 PR score for the co-creation also evaluates for that to zero, because the natural logarithm of of one is zero. Um, so that's why I tend to say that the optimal size of a pull request is one line of code that is reviewed immediately as it's being typed. And I honestly don't know a better way to achieve it than by pair and more programming. So the, the thing with it is that as a byproduct, we get these continuous immediate code reviews. I'm not going to go into psychological safety, trust vulnerability that tends to be built with co-creation, with working as a team together. That's a completely different talk. But you get so many benefits out of it. So I was plotting this on a on a on a time series, and here we can see a data set of of a bunch of PRs. Uh, on the y-axis we can see a score, and it's again on a um, logarithmic scale. And I think the lowest one was maybe around six or so, right? And that's one world that you get to see. And then the other world world is a continuous code reviews pairing or moving, which has this result as a zero. And if you try to optimize for these metrics that I talked about, then actually the best result that you can get is zero. So throughput or quality, uh, I would say both throughput and quality, um, because some assumptions don't hold true. And then I was also thinking, you know, um, what if we try to define pair programming uh, with this, uh, this orthodox definition of people spending twice as much time working on the same thing. Um, but then the wait time is zero because we get immediate review. Then how would the world look like? And this was, this was uh, just one of the examples um, of how sooner would we be able to finish, which is really important because of that learning cadence that I was talking about and why it's important in order to be able to deliver value to our customers sooner in order to, at the end, hopefully outrun the competition. So in this case, it was 3.3 times. The numbers, again, are not really important. And the accuracy is, I'm sure, not 100%. But they are a really good kind of conversation starters for teams to start evaluating the way that they, that they work. And with that, um, I just wanted to say that we've been, at least that's my impression, that we've been told all along that we'll achieve more if we limit and delay our interactions. But I hope that now you also have a data informed reason not a reason not to believe that. And with that, I would like to thank you for, for your attention, your time. Okay. Um, Feel free to rate the talk uh, outside. That's also what I've been told um, by the organizers. Yeah, thank you for your time. Thanks.